Morning Harvest at home. This is Elijah Hill. I'm so excited about today's broadcast. God is going to do so many things in your life today, and we are excited about it. I want to remind you about the Generations Conference that's coming up April 30th through May 1st. The information is going to be below, so go ahead, get your tickets, get registered. It's going to be phenomenal. We have something for every generation, so get your tickets. Now let's go ahead and get ready. I've learned this, that when the enemy knows he cannot kill you, and when the enemy understands that you won't self-destruct, his next attempt is to contain you. Here's what, he, here's what he knows. You are anointed. You are gifted. Yes, Lord. You have been empowered by God to do significant things in the earth. But what he knows is, if I cannot take you out, my agenda will be to neutralize you and to put you in a context where you can go this far, but no further. Containment is a military strategy. It's a military tactic that uh, the enemy will use to say, if I cannot fully destroy the enemy that is coming up against me, then what I'm going to do is make sure I keep him isolated and over there so that he does not get to what's over here. I believe that's important because as we deal with unlock, there are many of you that are not necessarily oppressed, but that doesn't mean you're not contained. Mm. I believe it's important that we have this conversation because if the enemy has an, has an agenda to keep me uh, contained or to cause me to only go so far and stop short of my potential, then I need to set it in my agenda today to break every aspect of containment that the adversary has attacked my life with. Somebody shout, I'm about to break containment. Now, let me tell you something that's interesting because I thought containment was really just about what the enemy may do, maybe spiritual influence that the enemy brings to keep you contained. But then as I have lived life and as I have studied the word of God, I learned that the greatest source of containment is not external, it is often internal. That oftentimes what contains me is not what Satan is doing to me, but what I am thinking about myself. The decisions I am now making, the thought processes that I have agreed with are keeping me at a place that I cannot get out. If I'm talking to anybody in the room that says, I've been there, Bishop. I've been at some points in my life where I know God has more for me. I know there's something he wants to do on the other side of where I am. And everybody else is applauding my progress thus far, but I am fully aware that there is more that God wants to do and I refuse to stop short of it somebody shout I'm about to break my life open today is the day I'm coming out of the prison I'm coming out of containment and I am going to do everything he said I could do and I'm going to be everything he said I could be and I'm about to go everywhere he said I could go and I'm going to accomplish everything he said I could accomplish somebody shout yes if you believe that I thought this was critical uh, to have this conversation because um, I, I, I felt it was necessary to deal with these aspects of our lives that keep us contained. And I wanted to tie it into our conversation from last week. We talked about a sensitive yet uh, important subject as we talked about Amnon and Tamar, the children of David. Tamar, his daughter who was raped by her brother uh, Amnon. And we talked about that and we talked about this daughter who was left desolate and how we are to protect and how we are to care for them but I wanted to pick up in that because how many of y'all have heard the name Absalom Absalom was the son of David who was like the big brother that when it happened he talked to Tamar and he said Tamar don't you tell anybody you just hang out with me and I got this I like Absalom because Absalom uh, is a big brother who says I got this I've got you covered but many times in church when we talk about Absalom we talk about the spirit of Absalom we talk about how Absalom, once he came back to Jerusalem, turned the hearts of the people away from David and how he was a betrayer and how he committed treason. And we talked about how you got to watch people that will whisper in people's ears and turn them away. But I thought it was important that if I'm going to talk about Absalom, I should at least trace the trauma that made Absalom who Absalom was. Because a lot of times we look at a person for what they become and we act like there was not a story or a cycle or a 
series of events that got me to where I was. We have the nerve sometimes, I'm about to get excited, we have the nerve sometimes to turn up our nose at people about where they are acting like there weren't some contributing factors that got them there. And I just believe that if we can trace Absalom's trauma, I believe today somebody can get a breakthrough. And so Absalom, hallelujah, when this happens, Absalom tells Tamar, stay in the house. It's interesting because the Bible says Absalom is angry. David is angry, but he does nothing. Absalom gets angry, and though he doesn't do the right thing, he does what he knows. He says, hey, sis, don't talk to anybody. Just stay here, and I'll cover you. Now, I was studying anger, and I was studying rage. Anybody ever been angry? Anybody ever felt enraged? Now, there are some people that have outrage. There are some of us who have enrage. Have you ever had rage? I thought that was important. He, I believe Absalom was enraged. And there are three types of anger that they talk about of how you express anger. Uh, number one, you have the passive aggressive. That when you make me angry, I act like I'm okay. You make me mad, but because I don't like confrontation, that's the passive aggressive version. They don't like confrontation, so they're going to act like they're okay, though they're boiling on the inside. This type of person eventually will burst and do a lot of damage once they talk. This type of person won't tell you directly what's wrong, but they will Facebook This type of person doesn't talk to you, but they will talk at you. And they'll do subtle little things. And then you have those, then you have the uh, more open aggression. You have the person who gets upset and, and they lose control. Now the issue with the first two is they both want control, but in handling their anger the way they deal with it, they actually lose control. The open aggression is I get so mad I start breaking stuff. I get so mad and the issue is I'm responding like that because I want to control and I feel like I'm losing control. But then the third form was to have assertive anger, which means I get angry, but I am still keeping my head. I got enough common sense to think about what the best outcome is. I'm not going to act like you didn't hurt me. I'm not going to act like nothing happened. I'm going to tell you, but I'm going to be so composed when I tell you that I actually have the capacity to listen to you in the process. So today, there's somebody already found yourself. You're passive aggressive, some of you are openly aggressive, and some of you say, I got to get to this assertive anger. Absalom is passively aggressive. He's angry, but he's quiet. You got to be careful when people get angry and quiet. Some people say, hey, you okay as long as I'm talking. But if I ever get quiet. So what happens is he gets quiet, but he's not over it. Just because you're silent doesn't mean you're over it. For, for three years, he gets quiet, and then all of a sudden, he plots to kill Amnon. He asks David, hey, David, will you go with me? He's angry, but he wants his father to come, and he wants his father to come and speak to the situation, or at least walk with me through this. And David says, I'm not going with you. Can you imagine, oh God, what had to be going on in Absalom's head? David, I have seen you fight for less reasons than this. But when I needed you to go to battle for me, you didn't even have the time of day to go with me when I needed you the most. Sometimes, if you'll just be honest, you get mad because you see people bend over backwards for lesser causes. But when you needed them, they were not present in your life. Am I talking to anybody? And everybody's mad at how Absalom is acting. But every now and then, you got to step back and say, Absalom is looking. And he's saying he's a hero to everybody else. But when I needed him to be heroic for me, he was missing in action. We've got angry young black men who are frustrated because when they needed somebody to be there for them, they were absent. Trying to figure out why is Absalom so angry? He wanted your attention and you didn't have time. Absalom says, I'll do it myself. He does it. He sets in motion this plan and he kills Amnon. And then what happens after he kills him? In the midst of this rage, he runs away. To this place called Geshur. When he gets to Geshur, 
he hides out there. He hides out in this place called Geshur. It's interesting. It means pride. Oh, my God. He goes and hides out in this place. He's running from his father. He's, he's, he's ashamed of what he's done, but he's still angry. And just like many of us that are in this room right now, glory to God, we have hid ourselves and our rage has become our cave. Oh, glory to God. He's frustrated. He's mad. He, 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 he doesn't know what to do. He's ashamed. He's afraid. What is David going to do? And what does David do? What does a father do when one of his sons is killed, one of his other boys? The Bible says David was angry, but yet again, David does nothing. He's mad. He's hurting. He lost Amnon. And in a sense, he's lost Absalom, but he says nothing. And so Absalom is left there. In the cage of his own rage to try to figure it out. Anybody ever been in a situation where you had to try to figure it out? People are trying to figure out why you're so frustrated and you're trying to figure out why you're so frustrated. You're in this cage called rage. I don't know about you, but I've been there. Where my frustration, I just couldn't get over it. And the crazy thing about Absalom is his name means peace. But he is about to act totally contrary to his character. He's about to act totally different than who he really is. Because sometimes life, I'm about to shout, sometimes life will get you out of character. And who the world sees is not who you really are. They just don't know who you really are. It's trapped behind the cage of your rage. You are a man of peace, but your pain has made you angry. He's angry, and David does nothing. David does nothing. All of a sudden, when David gets over Amnon's death, he, he finally starts to think about Absalom again. He thinks about Absalom, and Joab, who's his right-hand man, recognizes that David is thinking about him. And so he sets up a course of scenarios where David eventually brings Absalom back to the kingdom. He brings him to the kingdom, but doesn't say a word to him. He says, hey, go get, go get Absalom. Bring him back to the kingdom. Absalom comes back into the house but not David's heart. He's in his palace, but not in his presence. He brought him back where the stuff was, but didn't connect with him as a person. Let me help somebody. The stuff you buy will not replace the seeds of love that you have to sow. God help me. David thought, David thought, watch this. That's, that's how we do. We, we want to let people back in, but only so far. Now, I'm not going to talk to you like I used to talk to you. I'm just, you better be glad I let you in my space. And Absalom over time gets angry. Why? Because David is silent. He's not saying anything. He thinks having him in the palace is enough. Let me help you. Just because you don't talk about it doesn't mean it's going to get better. Uh, oh, God. Some of us, the worst thing we're doing to our situations is saying nothing. Your silence is allowing them to create scenarios in their own head that are creating wars that you don't even recognize are going on. Ah. Am I helping anybody in the room? Let me say that again. Your silence is letting the enemy create scenarios that are making the situation worse. You're going to have to say something. I know you're mad, but you better say something. I know you're frustrated, but you better say something. I know you're not happy about what they did, but you better say something. Absalom hears nothing from his father. He calls for Joab. He says, hey, Joe, listen. If dad wasn't going to talk to me, he could have just left me where I was. You see the, the pressure building? Now, let's think about David. Let's, let's think about David for a moment. Brother Chris, just come, come, come here just for a moment. Just stand right there. Yeah, come on up, come on up. You stand, stand. That's good, right there. Okay. Absalom is encaged by his rage. I believe David is encaged by his shame. 
The fact that he's ashamed over what he has done and the fact that he may have caused this situation, he can't get to his son and his son can't get to him. There's a boy who needs his dad and a dad who needs his son, but they can't connect because one is locked out due to shame and one is locked in due to rage. And sometimes we're mad. Can I just help somebody right now? Because sometimes you're mad at somebody and you're like, what are you going to do about what I'm in? And they don't know what to do because they feel like they're the reason you are where you are. And they think because they're, they caused your condition, they feel ashamed to try to speak to it to get you out of it. Can I just preach to some real people in here that say, when I became grown, I understood some stuff that mama did. I understood some stuff that daddy did. Some of us haven't made enough of our own life's mistakes. To give other people grace. David can't get to him. He can't get to David. David has shame. All of a sudden, watch this. I need somebody to do me a favor. Give me the chain here. Just hook it in. So, David brings him in. David's ready to forgive Absalom. But David has been quiet so long. Until now, Absalom can't forgive him. This has festered so long that now he does not even have, oh man, just hook it in, hook it in, tie it in real good. Just hook it in. Is it hooked? All right, good. You, yeah, just, just hook it around. Y'all know how unforgiveness is. Y'all thought it was a demon, didn't you? Wasn't a demon? That's keeping you contained is unforgiveness. Oh, the devil got me bound. No, man. Unforgiveness. The fact that you like you just you can't let it go. Just step to the side for a minute there, David, if you will. Because if I can be honest, you can stand right there, right there. If if, if I can be honest, I know what it's like. Many of you in this room know what it's like. There's some stuff you can forgive quickly, but there's some stuff it takes a while to get over. And then that stuff has triggers. So when you actually think you're over it and something happens that reminds you of it, you go all the way back to it. And now you are mad again like it happened all over again. And the good thing is, y'all might want me to stay in this cage because if I ever come out of this cage, I'm going to tear some up. So he's angry, he's angry, he's locked in this cage, and all of a sudden he begins to turn even worse. He begins now, he acts like he's okay, he acts like everything is well, but they are still not connected. And he starts turning the hearts of people, he turns the kingdom away, and eventually what happens to Absalom is he dies in the midst of battle because he gets the wrong counsel around him and he never deals with the issues that are causing his containment. He never deals with it, so he dies prematurely. Be careful who you listen to when you are enraged. Be careful who you let get in your ear when you're angry. The worst thing your ear can take when you are angry is somebody with an agenda. So it leads to his demise. And now David is hurting. And Absalom is gone. And I got a problem. Because I just don't think the story is supposed to end like that. There had to be a better way. All David had to do was come and make it right. But David didn't. But maybe David didn't know how. So let's fast forward. Because I believe there's a New Testament counterpart to get him out. If I could fast forward, I would fast forward to Mark 5 because there's a man who's in the tombs. There's a man who is in the tombs of, of the Gadarenes in Mark 5. And when Jesus comes, the Bible says this man is crying and he's cutting himself. He is so full of rage that they can't even tame him. Because when you are broken, people can't tame you. They can temper you, but they can't tame you. They can talk you down, but they can't tame that rage that is in your heart. Only God can deal with that stuff that is on the inside of you, that is hurting you, and that is working on you. So they try to chain him, but they can't. So in other words, 
because what is wrong with the man in the tombs is he's got something internally that is keeping him locked in but is there anybody that says today I got to break it I just believe like Absalom I've got too much potential to let my pain lock me here Woo, glory to God. I got too much potential to stay behind here. I can't touch the world behind these bars. I can't touch lives. I can't raise my kids like this. I can't be the husband I got to be. You can't be the wife you're called to be behind these bars. What are you going to do to get out of what you're in? What you're going to find is that Jesus comes on the scene. Come in, Mike, if you will, because you're going to represent that thing, that stronghold. That just stands at the door. Turn around. Because you ain't even looking at me. You just want to make sure I'm, 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 I stay locked in. So his job is to keep me locked in. Never able to walk into my future. It's the strong man. When rage and unforgiveness and hurt and pain are in your heart unresolved. It's the strong man. And it'll cause you to cut yourself off. From good people cut yourself off from good opportunities cut yourself off from who God says you are because you're locked in and contained and you are now beginning to self-destruct until Jesus shows up cuz just flex a little bit just flex a little bit just flex a little bit it's all right Kelsey, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, just holler back there. Yeah, just flex one more time. The strong man has, has got you bound until someone stronger. Until someone stronger. Yeah, yeah, somebody, somebody. Oh. Somebody say, my captivity looked big until Christ showed up. Come on, say somebody, my, 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 my stronghold was strong until the stronger one showed up. Until the one came who was able to liberate me and set me free. I wish I had somebody in the room to say, today is the day I'm coming out of my captivity. I can see my Savior coming. I can see him about to bring me out of this pain. I can see him about to bring me out of this stronghold. I can see him about to bring me out of this frustration. I can see him getting ready to bring me out of my depression. Watch this. The Bible says that when he sees Jesus, he's, he's still enchained, but he comes and he starts worshiping because sometimes... You're locked down, but you still know his presence. Some of you for 20 years, you've been bound and locked up. But when you get in his presence, you get a taste of liberty. But watch the conflict in his containment. He sees Christ and wants to worship. But the anger and the rage in him say, torment me not and don't make me go. In other words, there's a part that wants to get out and there's a part that wants to stay bound. Am I preaching to anybody in the room? That says there's a part of me that says, God, I want to be free. I want to forgive. I don't want to be angry anymore. I don't want to be frustrated anymore. I don't want to be heartbroken anymore. I want to be free. He said, but the problem is, I got another side of me that still wants to hold on to the anger. But I thank God that I know a man who's got the keys I said, I'm glad I know the one who's got the keys to get me out when I didn't know how to forgive myself, when I didn't know how to forgive the ones that hurt me. He came and broke the chains. He opened the door. And the Bible says, he said, I came to preach the opening of prison. In other words, it's safe for you to come out. You just need somebody to tell you, you can walk out now. I came to preach to somebody that's afraid to be hurt again. That's afraid to be heartbroken again. 
that's afraid they're going to treat you wrong again. He already opened the door. It's safe to come out. It's safe to trust again. It's safe to, I'm about to get a deliverance. I'm about, I feel a breakthrough stirring in this room. I said I feel a breakthrough stirring in the room. I said it's safe for you to come out now. I said it's safe to come out now. You might have to tip it toe out. You might have to crawl out. But come out, come out. Wherever you are, I said, come out, come out. Wherever you are, I said, come out, come out. Wherever you are, heartbroken, come out, come out. Disappointed, come out, come out. Full of frustration, come out, come out. Full of fear, come out, come out. Come out, come out. Come out, come out. Come out, come out. With your hands up, with your mouth open, say, Lord, I thank you for delivering me. He set me free. I said, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. I wish I had somebody in the room to say, thank God, I'm free. Lord. 
this part right here is for the people who know that what you went through changed you and had you out of character. Say, that's not who I am. So, Lord, I'm hollering until you set me free. That's not me. I am not bitter. I'm not angry. I don't mistreat people. I'm not unforgiving. I'm not resentful. I'm not full of malice. I'm not full of revenge. I got a heart to love right. I got a heart of peace. So Lord, I give you my pain so I can have my peace. I give you my pain so I can have my peace. an amazing word. Wow. I hope you were blessed. I was blessed. God is doing some amazing things in and around us. If you have given your life to Christ today, uh, if you want to say, God, I just want to uh, give my life to you. I want to give you my heart. Text Christ to 33222 and one of our team members will get back with you. We want to thank you for joining us one more time on our broadcast and we look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.